Well, hey, everybody. How is everybody doing tonight? You feeling good? It is so good to be with you guys tonight. Can I just say this? Y'all look good tonight. Maybe it's that cooler temp so you're not sweaty. Is that it? Maybe you spent a little bit extra time. Maybe for some of you, you actually showered today. I don't know, but you just, you guys look good. You guys look great tonight. What an awesome series we've been in so far. How many of you guys have loved the, uh, the start of Damaged Goods? Yes? Awesome. I- I'm so excited to be here in this series, to be wrapping it up with you guys tonight. If you don't know me, if you're brand new, I'm Josh Hansen. I'm the family pastor here, um, but I also love student ministry. Let me just say that. Student ministry, it might be my favorite. <clears throat> I mean, uh, I love all of family ministry, but uh, I'm super glad to be with you guys tonight. It's exciting that we've got this many students in the room. This is a pretty big crowd, right? Yeah, that's right. It's a great crowd, and you guys are bringing the energy. But tonight, we're we're wrapping up this series. Tonight, we're wrapping up this series called Damaged Goods. It's this concept that, yes, we are damaged, but because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, God sees us as good. Because of what Jesus did through our faith in Jesus, God sees us as good, even though we're broken, even though we're damaged. And it's that faith in Jesus, that's what defines us. That's what gives us our identity. That's what makes us who we are. Let me tell you something. Your identity isn't a football player. If you have faith in Jesus, it's a Christian. Your identity isn't the pretty girl. If you have faith in Jesus, it's follower of Jesus. Your identity isn't the skater kid, the funny kid, the weird kid, the band geek, the good singer, the science nerd. Your identity is child of God, chosen, loved, and forgiven through Jesus Christ, through faith in him. That's your identity. And this series, we want you to capture that identity. And as I said that, some of you are like, yeah, most of you are, you know, still trying to wake up from your after school nap. But a lot of you are nodding your head like, yeah, that, yeah, you're right. My, my identity is in Jesus. I think a lot of us, maybe even most of us in this room would say, yeah, that's right. That's true. I believe that. But do we actually live like it? Do we actually live like that's true? Or do we, in fact, struggle to to make our lives match our faith? I think most of us in this room, again, we, we fully understand that Jesus loves us. We fully believe that God has shown us that we matter to him. That's right, you matter to God. You matter here because you matter to God. You believe that. You've heard it week in, week out. But that doesn't stop you from chasing your identity in something this world offers, right? You've heard probably plenty of times, hopefully plenty of times, and if not, cool, for the first time, you've been forgiven of your sins by Jesus Christ. You've been forgiven of your sins. You are not a slave to sin anymore because of what Jesus did and how he freed you from that with his life, death, and resurrection. You've heard that. You believe it. But sometimes that doesn't stop you from living like Your past is who you are. Your sin is who you are. Your mistakes are who you are. And listen, I've been there. I'm still there from time to time. I remember back when I was your guys' age way, way, way long ago. When I was in high school, I tried to put my identity in the things I was good at. I was a good wrestler. I would wrestled since I was four years old, so I better be good by the time I get high school. That or I should just quit, right? But I was pretty good. So I put my identity in wrestling. And I was a smart kid, so I put my identity in my ability to get good grades, high test scores. I put my identity in these things, and you know what? I also chased them. When it came to wrestling, I worked hard. I put in work in the weight room, in the wrestling room, in the practice room. I trained in the off season, and by my junior year, I was starting to get some serious success. I had placed at the national tournament that summer, and then going into my, my, my junior year, I was ranked in the state at the beginning of the season. As the season went on, I was having a great year. I only had one loss going into sections. 
which is the qualifying tournament for the state tournament. And man, I was working hard. I was staying after practice, hitting extra conditioning, going extra matches, giving everything I had because I wanted to prove who I was. And so at sections, I wrestled well and I placed first, qualified for state. And I go to the state tournament, and I'm ready. I'm ready to prove to the world who I am. I'm ready to show everyone exactly who I am. I'm Josh Hansen, state champion wrestler. That's who I am. And I'm ready. I'm focused. I win my first match. Let's go. Win my second match. Now we rolling. Semifinals, I'm facing this undefeated senior who's just a monster. He came down from three weight classes, some people were saying. And I'm up against this guy, but I'm confident. I'm ready to show him who I am. And that was my best match of the whole tournament. I beat him 7-0. That's right, zero. He didn't score at all. And then I'm in the finals, right? And now it's time to really show. This is where everything comes down. It's the finals of the state wrestling tournament. And I go out there ready to show who I am, to prove who I am. And it's that confidence, that focus that got me off to a good start. I take him down. I, I get a big lead. Then I relax a little bit. He scores. Then I get another big lead. But by the end of the match, I get my hand raised. State champion. Dreams come true. Feeling of success and accomplishment, right? No. I get my hand raised and I'm like, wait, nothing changed. I walk off the mat, get interviewed by my local TV station, camera in my face, mic in my face, and I say a bunch of weird, really weird, stupid things that my brother still make fun of me for. And I walk away feeling like, man, nothing's changed. I get in the van ride home, and I'm like, maybe it'll sink in now. Maybe now I'll feel like, like man, I did it. I am something. I, I, I've shown who I am. And the whole van ride home, I'm like, still feel the same. See, I had achieved my goal. I'd found success, but I was still empty. See, I accomplished my goal without getting purpose. I proved my ability but was still insecure about my worth. My success never satisfied. See, my whole high school career, that's what I, I did. I succeeded. And this isn't bragging. This is just I chased after success as best I could. My career was filled with straight A's and accolades. I had this award, this prize, this perfect test score championships and awards and straight A's, but I was lost. I was lost. I had all these things. Everybody thought I had it all going for me, but I was lost. And so I head off to college trying to figure it out there. And then I experienced the exact opposite. I didn't see success. I saw struggle. College was harder. I failed my first class after failing my first test. Usually they go hand in hand. Then, wrestling was difficult. I had my first losing season in my entire life. I had a better record when I was four than when I was 19. And then I started doing things that I was ashamed of. And instead of success and, and, and praise, I was disappointed, frustrated, confused, lonely, anxious, sad, maybe even had feelings of depression and I was stuck living in sin. And I was ashamed of my life. See, because I had heard the gospel when I was little. I'd gone to church, I'd heard it. I understood that Jesus died for me, that my sins were forgiven. But I felt like I was stuck. In fact, I felt like I was trapped. And the reality is I was believing a lie. And this is the lie I was believing. Who I am comes from what I've done. I was believing that lie. And my guess is, my bet is, that if you're sitting in here tonight, you've believed that same lie. Who you are is what you've done. Let me set the record straight real quick. It's not true. It's a lie. The truth is, who I am comes from what Jesus did. The truth is, who you are doesn't come from what you've done. It comes from what Jesus did. 
who you are, what makes you you, what defines you, what gives you value, worth, purpose, promise, comes from what Jesus did. So tonight, if you forget everything else, remember that Jesus takes us from who we were to who we were called to be. He takes us from who we were to who we are called to be. That's what Jesus does. He does it from the moment we're saved all the way to the day he calls us home. Jesus takes us from who we were to who we are called to be. It's what his word teaches. It's what his life shows us. And I'm excited to dive into God's word tonight because that's what we do here at Scotts Hill Students. We study God's word. It's a core value of Scotts Hill, and so that's what we do because God's word in it is the gospel, the message of Jesus. In it is a way for us to get to know our heavenly father better. But before we jump in, before we start studying together, will you pray with me? Will you pray that, that God moves tonight? That this night isn't about the words that I speak, but the words that God speaks to you. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you tonight humbled that you've brought this many people here to worship your name. Humbled, God, that you even love us. We know we're damaged, but God, through Jesus and through what you've done, you see us as good. God, I thank you so much for that truth, and I pray tonight that you would use this message, use the words from your holy scriptures tonight to challenge us, to encourage us, and to transform us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, pull out your Bibles, grab your iPads, your notepads, your phone, whatever you use to read God's word on. I, I, I would ask this, listen, we're gonna have it up on the screens and that's cool if you don't have anything to read the Bible on, but it's gonna be more memorable and easy for you to retain this if you bring your own Bible. Bring your own Bible or download the YouVersion app on your phone, either one, I don't really care, but bring that because it's going to be helpful for you to, to keep this and for it to stick. And we're reading in Romans. Anybody here been reading through Romans this month? Anybody? Yeah, a few of you. That's awesome. Praise God. It's so cool when we commit to reading God's word because we know more about God. We learn more about him. And tonight we're in Romans 7, and we're going to start reading together in verse 15. Let's read this. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me that is my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. And I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I do not want to do, I'm not really the one doing it. It is sin living in me that does it. I've discovered this principle of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. And this power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Anybody out here relate to what I just read? This is the Apostle Paul. This is one of the heroes of the faith. And he's sitting here talking to the Romans, the Roman church that he planted. Of course, we believe this is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Every word of that Bible is written by God through man. Amen. But Paul is bearing his heart here. He's saying, listen, this is the struggle of life as you try to follow God. Why am I sinning? What is wrong with me? Anybody ever feel that? Like, why did I just say that? I, didn't, I don't actually hate my parents. Why did I say that? Why did I just do that? Why was I so mean to that person that I really care about? Why does this keep happening to me? I know it's wrong, so why do I keep doing it? I know what's right. Why can't I just do that? I'm sure you feel that tension. I think we all feel it. 
I think followers of Jesus feel it. I think people that don't follow Jesus feel it because I believe that God has given us moral absolutes when he created this earth. Right and wrong has been established and written into all of creation. And so if you feel that tension, even if you're not following Jesus, even if you don't even know who Jesus is quite yet, you probably understand what I'm talking about. You feel that tension. And for the Christian, it's especially hard because you've been revealed, it's been revealed to you, the Holy Spirit has awakened you, you see more clearly in God's word what is right and wrong, and you're struggling. The struggle is real. But I want to give you this encouragement. The one who wrote this is one of the heroes of the faith. Paul, the guy who planted all them churches, the guy who wrote through God, most of the New Testament was struggling the same as you. Hopefully that gives your heart a little bit of peace. Helps you to see that, man, we're in this. We're in this. We're all in this. There's no way of making it in this world and finally figuring it out. It's always day by day walking with God, trying to honor him. And see, look again at what he says in 15 and 19. I don't really understand myself. What is going on? I want to do what's right, but I don't. I want to read my Bible. I know that's what I'm supposed to do. I want to share Jesus with my friends, but I don't. I want to pray more, but I don't. Instead, I do the things I hate. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. I know that that sin that decision, that conversation, that text, that website, that lie, that moment. I knew it was wrong, but I did it anyway. This is real. This is your life. This is our lives as Christians. We feel this. And if you're a Christian, you get to a place where you're like, man, I don't, know if I, can, I don't know if I can do this. This is miserable. In fact, that's the exact words that Paul uses in verse 24. Look what he says. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? And we get to this point where we start getting in our feels. Our failures are before us. And the odds are stacked against us. And we're like, man, this is my good, but this is my bad. And I'm trying to call myself a Christian. And that's when those feelings of doubt, sadness, loneliness, depression, that's when they hit. And that's when the enemy tries to make you believe that that's who you are. That's what the enemy tries to use against you. Because we have an enemy who wants to take you down. We have a God who loves us and an enemy who wants to separate us from God. And when we feel like this, like why am I struggling in this again? I said I would never do that again and here I am right back at it. That's when the enemy attacks. But I want to tell you this. There's a reason he attacks you then. Because Satan wants to trap you in your past because he's scared to death of your future. Let me say that again. Satan is scared to death of your future. He knows that the people in this room can stomp on his head in the name of Jesus. He knows that when this generation, if this generation rises up and places their identity in Jesus, there will be freedom for them. He knows that if this generation, the people in this room rise up and place their identity in Jesus, that they will find purpose and power. He knows that if this generation, the people in this room, rise up, place their identity in Jesus, they'll become leaders, and they'll start influencing their schools. They'll start in influencing their neighborhoods. And he's scared that this generation, with their identity in Jesus, will change the world for God. That's right. That's you. Do you know that the reason you're attacked with those lies is because you have incredible potential? Do you know that the reason that you feel so much pressure is because God has so much promise 
for your life? And do you know that if you would just give it to Jesus, he would set you free? Students, Satan is scared of you. And when you claim the name of Jesus, you have power over him. Amen? I want you to see that tonight. I want you to understand that Satan wants you to believe that you are defined by your sin. But no, the miserable feeling that you have, the one that you share with, with Paul in verse 24, yeah, that might be tough. But if you keep reading, let's read verse 25 one more time. What a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life? And he comes to verse 25. Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. There is a way to remove that miserable feeling, and it's at the feet of Jesus. There is a way to release the pressure. And it's when you're on your knees talking to Jesus. There is a way for you to accept your true identity, and it's in Jesus. He'll free you, he'll fix you, and he'll give you the life that you've always known that you had, one with purpose. Because Jesus takes us from who we were to who we are called to be. And this is so important. When we think about who we're called to be, we have to understand our identity separated from our sin. We have to understand that we are separated from our sin. Yes, we may still sin, but our identity, who we are, is not associated with that. You want to know how I know this? Look back at verse 17 again. This is what Paul says. So I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me. You first read that, you're like, okay, Paul has multiple personalities. But then you realize what he's saying. And this is where power comes. If, if you're sleeping, wake up. Paul is telling you that you are not defined by your sin. You're defined by what Jesus did with your sin. He buried it. He put it to death. He laid it to rest as far as the east is from the west. Guess what? It is as far away from you as you can conceivably imagine. Not only are you not identified with your sin, it's not even close to you anymore. Jesus, he's not playing games when it comes to your sin. He removes it completely. And the enemy, he wants to tell you, no, nah, nah, you're stuck in that. That's who you are. That struggle with, with sexual temptation, that's who you are. Those lies that you keep telling again and again, that's who you are. No, in the name of Jesus, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus, you are loved. In the name of Jesus, you are free. You are powerful. You have everything you need. That's what, uh, that's what Pastor Phil's been teaching us on Sunday morning. We have everything we need in Jesus to live this life. Don't believe those lies, not for another minute. Because when you give your sin to Jesus, he takes it. He takes it all. And it doesn't matter how many times you have to go back to him. He keeps taking it. He keeps forgiving you. He keeps taking it. He keeps loving you. That's what we have in Jesus. And that's why we place our identity in him and not in our sin. That's why it's important for us to understand that we're not damaged goods. No, we're good even though we're damaged in Jesus. That's who you are. Claim that. Walk in it. Don't let the enemy lie to you, not for another day. And don't just take my word for it. Just because I'm up here and I'm shouting, I'm getting excited and I'm getting sweaty. Don't take my word for it. Look at the Bible. Look at what it says, Romans 3, 22. We are made right by God by placing our faith in Jesus. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who you are. Doesn't matter how far you've gone. Doesn't matter what you've done. No sin is beyond our Jesus. And there's more, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. That old life is gone. New life has begun. Rome, or Galatians 2, 20. 
My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. These verses can remind you of who you are because the lies aren't going to stop. I wish I could tell you they are. Your sin nature isn't going to just lay itself down. You have to lay it down in the name of Jesus. You have to choose to lay it down in the name of Jesus. The reason you struggle with sin is because you have a sin nature. But if you capture what Jesus is offering, if you accept what Jesus is giving you, every single day you can win. Every single day you can move forward, placing your identity in the right thing. And when you, you capture this truth, the enemy comes to lie to you. You can look back at him and say, that ain't me. Somebody say, that ain't me. Somebody say, my old self is gone. Somebody say, I'm new. That's who you are in Jesus. That's your identity. That's what the Bible teaches us. That's what the truth is through and through. And so as we think about how we're going to live this, how are we going to live this out, I want to give you two things. First, this. Give Jesus your sin and receive his forgiveness. Listen, give it to him. Receive his forgiveness. It's the gospel. And if you've never done it before, what's waiting for you on the other side is salvation. Eternity with God. If you're here tonight and you feel that tug on your heart, listen to it. Walk towards it. It's the Holy Spirit meeting you and saying, come home. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how far you've gone. What matters is God's love for you is bigger. Jesus' power is stronger and your future is better. Listen to it. Receive that because what you get is salvation. It's the gospel. And yes, it only saves you one time, but guess what? It transforms you every single time you do it. So Christian, follower of Jesus, go back every single day every single time you feel the weight of sin and give it to Jesus. That's not a one-time thing that happens at D now or Elevate Weekend or on a Sunday morning. That is something that, that you need to do all of your life because Jesus offers you forgiveness all of your life. Where sin abounds, grace abounds more. God will not run out of grace for you. He won't. John 1.9 puts it this way. 1 John 1.9. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful. Listen, I mean, he's faithful to the end. Doesn't matter how big or how often you sin. Doesn't matter how deep or dark or horrible it is. God is faithful to forgive it. Believe it. Believe it. Walk in it. There's nothing you can do that can separate you from God's love if you give that sin to Jesus. And then live like this, out with the old, in with the new. Start each day by denying your old self, your old life, and claim the new life you have in Jesus. Do what it says in Ephesians 4. 22 starts off saying like this, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life. You got to throw it off. You can't just wake up and say, oh, it fell off. If I get up fast enough, it'll fall off. Nah, you got to be intentional. You got to say, today... I'm putting that person to bed. I'm putting that person to death. That ain't me. And who I am is, is who God made me to be, the new life I have in him. Instead, let the spirit, the Holy Spirit, the thing that Jesus promises us, when, he, when we put faith in him, he promises us the Holy Spirit that walks with us, that gives us strength, that gives us power. Let it renew your thoughts and your attitudes. Put on your new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy that's your identity who you are in Jesus who you are when the Holy Spirit is, is flowing through you that's who you are you are not damaged goods but you are good because of Jesus you are good because of what he's done so don't be paralyzed by your past have faith in the future that God has called you to and remember that Jesus takes us from who we were to who we are called to be. Let's pray.